Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us, Cece, and spending some time with us. Today's subject is Shelter Telehealth, Telehealth for Better Outcomes, How Rescues, Fosters, and Shelters Can Use Virtual Services to Improve Health and Benefit Adoptions. Our presenter today is Dr. Ernie Ward. Dr. Ward is an internationally recognized veterinarian known for his work in the areas of general small animal practice, life extension, longevity practice management, and leadership. Dr. Ward is the founder of the Seaside Animal Care, a national practice of excellence, award-winning small animal veterinary clinic, and doggone healthy a practice dedicated to nutritional, behavioral, and integrative care in Calabash, North Carolina. He was awarded the Speaker of the Year Award for both the North American Veterinary Conference, NABC to us, and Western Veterinary Conference in Las Vegas. He has spoken at every major North American veterinary conference as well as throughout Europe, South America, and Asia, and he has been a guest lecturer at most U.S. veterinary schools. We welcome Dr. Ward. Uh, thank you so much. And definitely hit us up in the uh, chat. Tell us where you're from. Looks like we've got some Arizona, some Philly. Uh, I know we've got some North Carolina and New York also on the line. So definitely let us know. Throughout today's uh, presentation, you know, if you have questions, go ahead and hit them over there as well. We will be getting to, to your questions. I want to have a good discussion. You know, I'm deeply embedded in the shelter and foster community. I sit on several boards, both national and locally and regionally here uh, in the Southeast. East. Uh, but one of the things that doesn't, I, I don't talk about a lot, one of my first and hardest jobs uh, in college was working for the Albany Humane Society. So it's an HSUS shelter, an animal shelter, the quote unquote dog pound uh, in rural Southwest Georgia. And so for two years, um, I really had a deep experience that most veterinarians don't have. Um, Quite frankly, within about six months, uh, as they realized that, you know, I had skills, I'd worked in veterinary clinics most of my life and around animals my entire life, that I was really good at venipuncture. So I was quickly promoted to the euthanasia guy. And so for usually four to five days a week, and I say four to five because we would sometimes try to take off a Friday, uh, you know, my job was to euthanize uh, between 20 and 40 dogs and cats a day. Um, and I don't say that to bring anybody down, but I want you to know how committed I am to shelters and fostering around the world. And it's why it's been, you know, cornerstone of, of my messages. So I really think truly that every veterinarian should be required to work at a shelter or foster. Uh, it breaks my heart when I see some of these young students and they've never done that, or maybe they volunteered for four hours at some point, because I think it's important for us to understand the depth and scope of the problem. And that's why when a CC Animal Health said, hey, would you be willing to talk to some shelter, you know, and foster groups on our behalf? I mean, I will always, always be there for you. So this is something that I can't thank you enough from the bottom of my heart. What you do is often overlooked and underappreciated. And so I just really wanted to make sure that you understood my deepest gratitude uh, for, for what you do in your efforts. And I know sometimes there can be tension and friction between the veterinary community and shelters and rescues. I've never understood that, but I think it comes from a place of ignorance on both parts, right? And so I think the more we can work together, of course, we're all after the same goal. So um, again, we'll kind of jump into this. The way this is going to work today, I'm going to give, uh, you know, sort of some slides in a presentation, but I really want to save time for your questions and discussion. And so, you know, and this can be about anything. This can be about the current pandemic that we're dealing with and some of the questions that you're getting from prospective pet parents, you know, or maybe how do you disinfect your facilities? I mean, these are things that, that I've been really closely, you know, working on uh, since this thing really started in, in late January, early February with veterinary community. So, so if you have any of those questions, it's a great opportunity. We're going to focus, you know, a little bit on the telehealth, telemedicine aspect, uh, but I really want to share some of the best practices. Um, if you could do me a huge favor, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Facebook. Um, if you like podcasts, we have a weekly podcast dedicated to veterinary topics called the Veterinary Viewfinder. But if you're like us, I mean, you're dealing with these real world problems. In fact, this week we uh, join with one of our colleagues to talk about resilience during these times, right? Because we all need to fortify and, and somehow nurture our souls because I don't know about you, but some of these 
times I've been running close to empty because just this unprecedented, chaotic, stressful time. But, you know, so we do things like that. Obviously, I do a lot of, of videos and webinars and things like that. But if you could, you know, just follow me on wherever you like to follow. And, and I'd love to, to, you know, have you along for sure. So what I'm going to try to cover over the next 30 minutes and, and we will be jumping around just a bit, but number one, I want us to make sure that we reserve some time today to talk about some of the specific pandemic pet problems. Now, I was fortunate enough to do a webinar with a CC and a couple of other uh, companies during this time to talk about the specific challenges that adoptions and fostering have faced during the pandemic period. Uh, so definitely check out that library of, as they call them, webbies over at ccanimalhealth.com. Uh, you can click and find access to all of that. But I, I, there are some specific behavioral issues that we are seeing, that you are seeing, and I want us to make sure that we understand and address them effectively. I want to talk about, of course, the teleterms, the telehealth, teletriage, telemedicine, what that means for us in the shelter environment, online adoptions, and something that I've been calling now for the past couple of years, virtual tethering. I actually called it the virtual leash at first till one of my colleagues said, leash is maybe not the right term, but so tethering, I'm going to talk about how we can stay connected using online technologies. And then I do want to leave plenty of time for discussion. Um, but I want to start out today by saying why this is important. And I think we have to understand that people that are visiting shelters, that are visiting businesses, that are starting to emerge from their self-quarantine are worried. I mean, you may feel the same fears and anxiety that I certainly have felt. I was at a hardware store uh, a week ago. We had to pick up some, some supplies for home. And, you know, there were a lot of people there. I live in rural North Carolina who were not wearing masks. They were not practicing social distancing. And my wife and I were very uncomfortable. Um, and I don't think that makes us, you know, on the extreme, you know, oh my gosh, Ernie's running around the world scared to death. I think we're just concerned and, and we don't know what that means for society at large. So a lot of pet parents are the same way. Um, there's also this built in, I'm sure you've heard these concerns, I'm hearing them online about, wow, don't adopt a cat now because you might get a COVID cat. And if you've heard those kind of rumors, definitely hit us up in the chat because you know I'm trying to, to tell my veterinary colleagues that this stuff is actually happening. And so there's been a lot of confusion, misinformation. Um, I've done a lot of webinars and videos and I'll, I'll have links to some of those, but definitely if you just go to Dr. Ernie Ward and you look at video and blogs, I've, there's tons of transcripts and video links and all that kind of stuff of the content. I've been trying to dispel some of these myths, but people are worried about going to a shelter and getting a sick pet. They're also worried about getting sick themselves. So I think that it's really important for us as, as pet professionals to communicate with the public what we are doing to ensure safety safety of you as a prospective pet parent visiting our shelter or foster or, or whatever, right? Meeting our folks. Uh, for you, how are you keeping your staff? Because a lot of people are worried, you know, okay, I get it. You guys are taking care of the, the dogs and the cats, but what about your people? Like, are your people, are you checking their temperature? Are they wearing PPE? So these are things we can do to help allay fears and concerns. And again, I've really been emphasizing this to the vet community because I think if we assume that people think, oh, it's safe to go to the veterinarian, I think that's a very dangerous assumption. I think if we assume that people don't associate going to an animal shelter with potentially contracting coronavirus, I think that's a dangerous assumption. So I wanna make sure that we are transparent, that we are open, we communicate fully the steps that we are taking to keep everybody safe, including of course the pets in our charge. So just something to think about. So how would I do that? What have I been encouraging vets to do all over the country and quite frankly, all over the world? Um, share pictures, share videos, share the stories. You're gonna keep hearing those themes over and over again. We live in a visually dominated world today. I mean, you've probably scrolled or you may be scrolling right now your Instagram feed, your social media or whatever. And so we know that these types of images are what impact pet parents the most. So I would encourage you to you know, have signs up, you know, take pictures of what you're doing in your facilities and so forth. Um, the other thing is too, people don't, 
like change. And so if they just show up at your shelter, and let's say it's somebody who adopted a dog from you, you know, four years ago, and they suddenly roll up and wow, it's by appointment only, which of course, many of our shelters have gone to, you know, or it's limited access. And so they go in there, they may say, whoa, what is going on around here? And so when we don't meet those expectations, that's of course, when frustration can, can boil over. But more importantly, that's when people just get back in the car and leave, meaning that we miss a potential foster or shelter. So just things to consider uh, as we move forward in this time. Um, I do want to just focus a little bit and you'll notice some of these slides will have like links to videos and and blogs and things that I've written. There's a couple over there. So if you go to YouTube off label veterinary news, definitely subscribe. It means the world to me uh, and it costs you nothing. But um, I really, you know, I try to keep uh, the veterinary and pet professional community is updated on these types of topics. But we want to make sure that that pet parents also understand that if they adopt a pet from your shelter, they're probably going to have to go visit a veterinarian sometime in the near future. And so it's really important for us to communicate with the veterinarians that you recommend or work with in your community to say, look, you know, we want to make sure that our clients feel comfortable going in for these follow-up visits, these follow-up immunizations, spay neuters, whatever it may be, because I've heard too many stories uh, during this past three-month period where pet parents just aren't going to the vet. And so, you know, Parvo developed. I mean, you guys are probably seeing the same types of sad tales that I am seeing. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our, our shelters that I sit with, a, a rescue rather, we had a lady who adopted a puppy, did not go to the veterinarian, later claimed that it was because she was afraid you know, to take it out in the public, didn't know vets were open and all this sort of nonsense. Uh, the dog, of course, was allowed to Rome <laughs> and contracted parvovirus. And then of course she was very angry with our rescue. Uh, you know these stories and it just breaks my heart because you know, again, I'm gonna do everything to eliminate those barriers to care. Um, you guys know about the um, curbside service. You know, they're just not allowing people in the clinic. So you drive up and so forth. I think I have a slide just giving a brief overview. You know, you make an appointment, you show up, they take the pet from you, take it inside or whatever. Um, I'm really leaning on the veterinary community to, to make these experiences better. Uh, I don't think that these are long-term solutions at all, because let's face it, we're about to hit summer. And so while that may have worked in March and April, and maybe even May in some parts of the country, it's not going to work in July in North Carolina, Mississippi, or Southern California, right? It's not gonna work in New York. And so I think we're gonna to have to continue to evolve and get better. And that's why you know, I, I am pushing for telemedicine, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, also, there's an, another additional concern from cat owners because we already know they're definitely fearful of taking their cat in the carrier. Um, and that's justified, don't get me wrong, but now suddenly they have to take their fur baby, it's going to be taken by somebody out in the parking lot. I mean, you know, that's a lot of stress and anxiety for a lot of cat owners. And so I want to make sure that we, you know, are trying to solve those problems. Um, I also think that for adoptions and for veterinary care, this is always going to be an in-person, face-to-face transaction. And I even hate to use the word transaction there, but in the end, you know, we are doing something in exchange for something else. And so, um, I just don't see this entire process moving into a virtual realm. Uh, or as I was joking to some veterinarians during a, a lecture I gave not too long ago online, I said, or until we have all virtual pets, and that means having virtual families, which my wife might say that's a good thing. She would probably trade me in for a virtual husband, I would imagine some days. Um, so I think that we need to see how virtual options can assist us, right? How can it enhance and enrich the adoption foster process, the veterinary experience? Again, I see this as synergistic, as sort of an addition to, not a replacement of. And I think that we really need to think in those terms because right now what is happening, and this is happening at a regulatory level, uh, is that they are seeing these two as opposing, and I see them again as synergistic and dualistic. So, uh, you know. Now, a lot of people are going online for medical services, and this has impact on the foster and shelter community as well as the veterinary community because what happened at the beginning of the shutdown coronavirus pandemic was that the federal government 
Imo removed, eliminated many barriers to telemedicine that had been in existence for years, decades. And one of them was how Medicare, Medicaid would actually pay for some of these virtual visits. And suddenly, you know, obviously in the interest of public safety and health, they said, forget it, we are paying for it. Uh, in fact, we're encouraging the most vulnerable population, which are elderly, typically on some form of Medicare, Medicaid assistance, uh, like my mother. And they're saying, hey, we will pay for it. So suddenly now, millions of Americans, many older Americans were able to meet with their doctor, my mom, my wife, my daughters, right? We've all done telemedicine during this pandemic. And so that is a catalyst. And in fact, one of my very first uh, blogs prior to this, uh, actually this, this happening was I wrote about this is the time when I think change is really going to happen in our profession with regards to telemedicine. And it has. Uh, but let's just go over some of the, the simple for, forms of, of telemedicine that we're looking at. I did sit on the the uh, Telehealth, Telemedicine, and Veterinary Practice Committee with the AVMA uh, several years ago. We've got you know, our published guidelines that are you can find at avma.org. Uh, they're public, publicly accessible. Um, and there were really three distinct terms with le not legal necessarily, but regulatory definitions that we need to be familiar with. The first is telehealth. In fact, a colleague of mine today invited me to a webinar where he's talking about telehealth and teletriage. And I said, thanks, but no thanks. I'm interested in telemedicine. And as you look at these definitions, you will see clearly why I am not as interested in telehealth and teletriage. Both serve a purpose, but both are also not what we're really looking for. Now, telehealth is just general advice. Quite frankly, I engage in telehealth almost every day. Uh, yesterday, I had a, a long interview that was with a, a, an on, a huge online uh, community called Board Panda. It's a blog, a website, Facebook. I mean, millions, millions of, of viewers or readers or whatever. Um, and me giving general medical advice around pet obesity, which, you know, that's what I'm known for many times, nutrition and obesity, um, that is telehealth. Right? That could be construed as general health information I'm disseminating to someone I don't have a relationship with when I'm not making a diagnosis or prescribing medication or treatment. So then we move to teletriage, and that's what most veterinarians think of as telemedicine, but that's wrong because teletriage is just one level up from telehealth. It's where you then contract with, and typically this is a paid environment, so you're going online, you're on your phone, whatever, you're talking to a veterinarian or a veterinary technician, you're paying a fee typically, and you're saying, is this an emergency? And quite frankly, they can really only do one of two things with triage, just like the word says. It's an emergency. Go see a veterinarian immediately. Or it doesn't sound like an emergency you can probably see your vet tomorrow. Now, the problem, of course, as you can immediately see, is they quickly stray over into the next level, and what we're all here to talk about a little bit, is telemedicine. And that is the ability to diagnose and prescribe. All right, so this is where, if the teletriage service says, yeah, give that medication, wow. And in fact, there's a case right now uh, going, uh, well, it's early stages, it's just been filed with the medical board as a complaint, uh, out west, and I can't get into more specifics than that, uh, where a veterinarian, um, one of their clients called a teletriage service. The veterinarian said, okay, it's okay to give an eye drop. And listen, just please, telemedicine, teletriage, this is not a good, if your dog or cat has an eye problem, this is something that you need to see your veterinarian about, not just some online service. Anyway, they gave the wrong medication. The dog now has a, what we call a melting ulcer. It's disaster. This dog will most likely lose vision. And so, you know, obviously the veterinarian who has the relationship is very upset that the teletriage slipped over into telemedicine, an illegal act in that state at this time. And therefore, you know, we, got trouble. So you can see where liability becomes really important to us as veterinarians, because here's the other thing that there's no liability for that veterinarian. All this veterinarian can do is make a state medical board complaint. So, you know, I'm not going to be able to get damages or anything like that. Um, so telemedicine is what we're all here to seek. That is what humans are used to doing. That is what you may have done with your children. You know, that's what you may have done. My mom has had to do this uh, with telemedicine uh, with her doctor. So they were able to see you, examine you, whatever they can, uh, and then do a prescription. Um, I'm not going to, you know, get into a lot of it. But again, as we talked about it, the legal sticking point is whether or not 
like in that teletriage example of the eye, right? Whether or not you can establish a, what's called a veterinarian client patient relationship. That's the medical contract that we have with you, whether you're a shelter employee or a, a, this is your own pet. And so basically, you know, that occurs physically. And most states actually have provisions stating that you must be seen in person within a period of time, typically it's within a year. Now, once you have a VCPR, then of course that opens up avenues of treatment or examination such as telemedicine. And this is why you can see I've been pushing vets for years just to say, look, just do it for the, your existing clients. This is easy. I mean, this is settled in law. I don't understand the big, big question, um, but you can't establish it. Now, there've been a couple, a handful of states that have loosened some of their regulations during the current pandemic. These are temporary, uh, you know, lessening of the of the the uh, of the definitions of VCPR, but we don't expect that to stick around for much longer. Now, I have been talking to vets about this, and I'm going to tell you the same thing I'm telling vets because, as shelter community, you know, we want to make sure that we are sort of understanding what they can do. Uh, if you have an existing relationship, they've seen the pet or whatever, you know. V this VCPR is established in your state, then you can do telemedicine. So I see this, especially with pet owners all the time, skin allergies, this is that time of year, it's a great opportunity. Perhaps the best and the, the champion of all of this, is, which is why ACC is so kind to sponsor this content today, even though they have nothing to do with telemedicine, telehealth, or teletriage, um, is because we know that behavioral concept, consults are typically best in the home, right? So this is a way for a veterinarian to get in the home, observe the behavior, where it's happening, see the triggers in action. So this allows you to do much better uh, job as far as a veterinarian in evaluating behavior consultation. So I love it. Obviously a lot of chronic things. Um, and if the veterinarian says that it's more complicated, like I was using an eye example, I really probably need to do a several tests to determine if that's something we can just give you drops over or not. But uh, you know, again, you can do that. Um, if you're talking about telemedicine with your, your prospective pet parents or pet parents or yourself, there's really a couple of quick things I want to review. Uh, we also did an entire webby on this, so definitely go back to a CC Animal Health, check out their archive of amazing webinars. Most of them are short like this with great discussions, uh, but you know, I'm just going to give you the highlights of what we told pet parents uh, here not too long ago. Number one, email in advance the symptoms, your questions, email videos of the behavior, of the limping, of the whatever. Take really good, clear, well-lit pictures of a skin lesion or an ear infection, right? Like those things can sort of pave the way for it because one of two things will typically happen. One, that may be a red flag for your veterinarian who says, whoa, this looks like something more serious. I don't think we can effectively do this uh, over the internet or a FaceTime call or whatever they're using. Um, and so they want to see you in the office. And that's fine. That's for you and your veterinarian to discuss. But I think that that can also help, you know, sort of accelerate the process with your veterinarian. And often I can tell you if, if they're like me and, and my colleagues, you know, we're sitting there looking, okay, this is, we see Buster for this, you know, the past two years, it's June, it's atopy, you know, uh, seasonal allergies or it's flea allergies. Let's go ahead and get on with it. You know, we can do that via virtual visit. Um, also just two things, make sure that you tell your prospective pet parents as well as yourself, um, how much is it? Uh, I've had more complaints about this exact issue than nearly anything else. And, and what's happening is vets aren't being clear because they don't quite know. I was telling a story to the pet parents the other day here at a CC Animal Health webinar. And basically this lady was like very, very upset because the veterinarian charged her almost twice what she was expecting to, um, to, to pay. And so when the lady asked her why you know, are you charging me so much more? He said, it took longer, right? So kind of establish the boundaries and, and what, you know, what is it, how long will it last and so forth. All right, now I wanna kind of spend the last few minutes here before we get to the discussion. So it definitely start hitting up questions, comments, you know, things that you wanna ask about. And again, we can talk about coronavirus and so forth, but I really wanna make sure that, you know, we're addressing your questions uh, if you have any. Number one, uh, virtual and online pet adoptions 
they've never been more widely accepted by the public. I mean, there's a lot of us that have done this for a long time and we were experimenting with websites, putting up pictures and videos and telling stories about the dogs and cats. And really there was sort of this generational shift from people that were like, ah, I really wanna go see the dog to people that are used to swiping left if they wanna have a date, right? So this has been a, a transformative generational shift that has occurred. And so the clinics that were early adopting this a decade ago, even though the track was pretty slick back then, now they're really gaining purchase because suddenly all of these younger pet parents are used to swiping left if they like it or right or whatever. I don't use those services, but you swipe one way or the other if you like it or you don't like it. And that's really where we are today. So if you're not in the game already, get in the game. There are several third party, you know, turnkey operations. You can download and, and purchase and subscribe to some softwares that are specific for shelters and so forth. So a lot of you just you know, do some quick Google searches, talk to your colleagues, find out what's working and what you like and so forth. Um, regardless, you can definitely share videos and pictures and the stories, which is the important element as we've all known all these years. It's easier in a foster setting because you typically have more background, but it's really important to share like, how did that dog get to you? I'll never forget, you know, even as a young, young man working uh, for HSUS in, in Albany, um, I can remember walking the floor, you know, especially in the puppy room. And, and when you would tell people, we found these six puppies by the road down near the Flint River, right? Some, some story like that, right? Because, you know, that happens. I mean, they're in a box down by the river because somebody dumped them there. Well, you could just see that connection because, you know, that's sort of the true rescue mentality right there in play because they're like, oh my gosh, these puppies started out about as bad as you can start out. And so that is that extra element that just might, you know, again, assuming that it's the right breed, temperament, home setting and so forth. But, you know, that's the thing that can be the nudge over the top. So I really like the stories. Uh, again, in the foster communities, I know here with our, our foster race that I, I sit on the board with, you know, we are really, I, I think that team does a fantastic job of telling the story. Like how did this dog wind up in this situation where it needs a better home or a home, you know, I, I, so make sure you're using that. And we've had great success. I mean, this is, you know, very, very rural, very, very basic, but just putting these pictures out on Facebook, these videos are what really sell it. As you guys know, just when people can actually see the dog walking around or the cat, you know, in the cage or whatever, um, it really helps. I do want to talk though about this virtual tethering for a few minutes before we start jumping on some questions. And again, start putting them in there if you can, because we really want to have a, a good discussion with you guys. Um, but I call this tethering because I think that you know, having worked in with shelters and, and different organizations that do fostering over the years, you and I know the biggest fear we have is rebounds, right? I mean, that is that is the fear. And there are, have been plenty of times when I've been involved, just like many of you, when you're like going, that one's coming back. This is not going to, this is not going to work out, right? I mean, you don't really know how to fix it. You don't really know how to say no, but you just have that, that feeling deep down in your bones that say, oh, I don't feel, I don't know, this one's coming back. And so in order to help overcome that, you know, we've, we've, all of us have tried different things, but one of the areas that the, the fosters and the shelters that really crush it, that do a great job, and they have these long retentions, you know, the 95% of the people stick, so to speak, you know, these are the ones that do some simple follow-up care. And I understand, and everybody throws the same thing back at me, whether they're veterinarians, shelters, or fosters, they say, we don't have time, we don't have the manpower, we don't have the resources, right? And I get that, but now we're kind of in a virtual world where, you can automate some of this, but you still need to be doing the 48 hour callback, you know, the five or seven day callback, the two week callback, the one month callback, because what you're trying to do is recognize and intervene early when a problem posts, right? Um, one of our, our fosters not too long ago during, you know, it was at two weeks. All right. And the, 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 older couple that had taken this older dog in, uh, and this was a great fit, like everything about it from temperament testing to home, you know, home test, uh, home checks, everything was perfect. Like, you know, so all of us were like, Ooh, okay. But they're starting to have problems. Now you've got two choices. If you don't intervene, if you don't have that conversation, give them another week and they're calling us back and saying, it's just not working out. But as it was, and as it turned out to be, thankfully, 
we were able to intercept, intervene, give them some tips, right? And honestly, this had more to do with the dogs adapting to a new routine, a new diet, a new everything. I mean, come on. And really, it was just a matter of sort of assuaging those fears. And and that's the one really big take home message is that I would say you've got to be doing these follow up, these tethers, these check ins. And I think now with the advent of video calls, video conferencing, FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, so forth, you know, it's never been easier and it's a richer experience. And I understand the demands of human resources, but we're also using volunteers. And these may be people that the, the foster or the adopt, adoptive family may have never met before. But there's nothing to say somebody representing our shelter, our foster, can't call them up and say, how's it going? And here's the great news. You don't have to solve their problem on that call. Sometimes it's just that initiation. Then they say, whoa, okay, there's a behavior issue going on. Whoa, there's diarrhea, vomiting. Whoa, there's some medical problem, whatever, right? Um, behavioral issue. So now I'm going to say, hey, you know what? Listen, I want to talk to our veterinarian. I want to talk to our shelter director. I want to talk to our head of our foster, right? Whatever it might be, you can always pass them off because, again, it's the recognition that has to occur. Because if we're not aware that a problem is starting to develop, then here's the problem. We can't intervene. We can't solve it. And the other thing, too, is that I, I, I will say more than once in my life, and I've been doing this now for nearly 30 years, so um, take that for what it is, um, but we are able to also intervene and find a better home, right? Because just sometimes it's not a perfect thing. So I would also encourage you to be looking at some of these automated responses. So like right now, there are several text uh, companies, uh, texting companies, services that will allow you to enter in like a, a text that will say at two months, how is it going? This is Dr. Ward calling from Race Animal Rescue, you know, uh, when to check on, on your, your, your new adopt, your new foster, right? It can be almost that generic and it is that generic, uh, but these types of, of device or services are being deployed by auto mechanics, by hairdressers. I mean, this thing runs the gamut. You just apply it to you. And again, sometimes just getting that nudge, right? That text that says, hey, this is Sheila from, you know, ABC Animal Rescue or Animal Shelter. Uh, just uh, wanted to check in with you, see how things are going with your new adoption. If you don't mind responding, uh, replying to this text uh, and, and we'll get right back, you know, we'd like to see how things are going. Those check-ins can go back and forth. And, you know, the other thing too, I was talking with a shelter here last year before all this stuff happened and they were beginning to roll out some of these types of strategies and they were asking me for some advice and they were like, you know, but man, only like 40% of the people responded to these SMS or text messages. And I was like, that's amazing because that's 40% more than you were doing prior to that. I mean, so again, let's look at it relativistically. Let's say, hey, you know, this is a step in the right direction. I don't think you have to have 100% for this to be a success in my opinion. So again, we're gonna talk more about this. I do wanna make sure we point out, uh, Assisi obviously loves shelter community and we wanna make sure that you understand they've got some amazing offers. If you don't know about the Calmer Canine, definitely go check it out. I mean, they've got their own website. You can go to uh, Calmer K9, but it's a K and a nine.com, Calmer K9, uh, or just go to Assisi Animal Health. There's so much amazing research around this type of technology. Remember, this is not non-prescription drugs. Uh, this isn't even supplements, right? This is a form of electrical energy that is being used to change behaviors. And this stuff is being used now with PTSD, depression, anxiety in humans. I mean, this is FDA approved stuff. This has been going on. You know, it's been sort of simmering along for 20 years, but now there's tons of research that's been dumped you know, in the medical community over the past five years in particular. And you know, suddenly I think most of the psychiatrists, psychologists, therapy world on the human side, they're all in on this type of technology. And of course now the veterinary community is starting to wake up as well. So definitely check out these uh, deals and, you know, take advantage of for your shelter. Um, and again, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to say there. So I'd like to open it up for some questions. Now, uh, I think Carolyn, we're probably at a good time to take some discussion. Again, anything, if you have questions about telemedicine, tethering, you know, coronavirus, whatever. I'm giving them a few minutes because they were listening to you. I'm giving them a, a few minutes to get their questions in. And again, you know, Carolyn, it, it's always remarkable to me 
when companies like a CC Animal Health, you know, you're doing this just for the good of the community. So I, I got to tell you, I am just so grateful for the opportunity because, you know, let's face it, most of the time, these types of discussions are going to be paid for by a tele something company. So, you know, it's nice to get it in a truly unfiltered, unbiased, neutral fashion. So you got, you guys got the, the authentic scoop on this stuff. Thank you. It is a part of our mission. Yeah. yeah. We are all animal lovers here at ACC. And whenever you call us, you're talking to a member of ACC, not to somewhere else. Okay. So where are you with your questions, everyone? I realized that he was very complete in his presentation, but I'm sure you have questions. I, yeah, I'd love to know if anybody out there in the shelter foster world are hearing all the rumors about, you know, cats getting coronavirus, spreading it to people and cats spreading it to each other and so forth. I mean, that is really, you know, I, I did an entire video. I've, I've done, I guess, three videos just on that for, for pet owners and vet professionals because, um, yeah, a lot of misinformation and really concerning to me, uh, especially when we look at from a rescue shelter standpoint, if... Uh, if people become afraid of cats being a carrier or transmitter somehow of coronavirus, you know, Carolyn, that's, that's, that's a problem for us. It, it is. I hate misinformation and I hate yep. making people afraid. Yep. Yeah. I, I, it's um, yeah. So we, as a community, as pet professionals have got to do a better job. I mean, you know, I, I've spent an inordinate amount of time. In fact, I got accused by one of my veterinary colleagues. Of, Can you just shut up with a coronavirus already? Because, you know, <laughs> But I, I, the more myths and rumors that I see out there in the real world, it's like, we, we got to shut this down. No, we can't let it stand, you know. Okay, I am going to say that you have covered what they had time to hear today. We are on people's lunch, lunch breaks, and uh, particularly in this particular group of people, because they are all working. Uh, yeah. It is happy news that we hear that in this era, there are so many adoptions going on. What we yes. want to be, what we want to be uh, aware and sure of, is that they remain adopted. Exactly. That is that is my biggest goal right now is to to help all these first time pet parents really do the right thing, understand how to be good pet stewards, and have a lifetime of enjoyment. And so that this generation now has five, six, seven pets during their lifetime. That's what our goal is. I think all of us would agree with with that. And so again, thanks for all that you're doing in the shelter and rescue community. You know where my heart is, and I just can't thank you enough for all of your hard work. Thank you, Dr. Ward, and we look forward to your next presentation. For those of you on, once a week, we generally have something specifically for shelter adoption rescue, uh, and it's posted on our website under pet owners, and if you go down there, you'll see the schedule of Webby's. We look, oh, here's a question. Hang on. Uh, how do you explain to potential adopters that it is a rumor about cats getting COVID-19? Yeah, well, and, and there's a there's a lot to unpack in that because the fact is that just like SARS back in 2003, this particular coronavirus has an affinity for a type of receptor called ACE2 that cats and ferrets in particular have a high number of similar to humans. So the fact is they can contract COVID-19 coronavirus, um, but they can't or they haven't yet been shown to transmit that to humans. And this is most likely due to the viral load that cats produce. Again, drawing on some early research that's come out of Asia and in Europe. I mean, Belgium has been really one of the first to move on this uh, as far as some of the research that's come out. Um, but we also have all the SARS, the original SARS uh, research from 2003, 2004. And so cats, you know, just don't pose a threat to humans. Having said that, that's why you've seen me and others be very clear to cat owners, hey, cats can potentially transmit this between cats, so it's a good idea to keep your cats indoors and certainly away from unknown cats. Uh, having said that, you know, the main thing is, A, be truthful and transparent. Say, you know, I know you, I, you probably heard these rumors, and it's true. Cats do seem to be able to somehow, you know, 
carry coronavirus within themselves. But what we also know is they don't appear to shed it in high enough quantities to affect humans. And so the same rules that apply for you, you know, let's do good social distancing with your cat and yourselves and your family. And if someone in your family does get sick, we ask that just like you would do with your children or your grandparents, that you maybe keep your cats away from them as well until they fully recovered. So I just, I've been very open and honest about it. You know, the fact is they just don't pose a threat to us. That's the rumor that's the most damaging and deadly. Uh, but you know the fact is they can actually be infected with SARS-CoV-2. They can show some COVID-like symptoms, okay? And that there's been some question amongst you know what how severe these signs are. I mean, we go back to the Bronx cats, the the, the tigers that, that contracted it. You know, they were displaying some upper respiratory symbols uh, signs. Uh, a cat in Belgium was also reported to have some mild respiratory signs. So, you know, there there's that aspect of it. But again, they just don't seem to shed it. So I think you just got to stay up on, on this for sure. This is actively being researched around the world. In fact, just this week, you might recall, and if you haven't seen it yet, the FDA just released a very short short little cartoony video about this exact issue saying that you can't get it from your dog or your cat. However, you should be practicing social distancing. I mean, all the things that we've been saying. Um, there's a couple of videos I made particular to this topic that go into the research. So if you go back and look on off-label veterinary news, there's one that talks about you probably can't get coronavirus from your pet. And you know the cats and coronavirus, I've done a couple around the cats for sure. Uh, and of course the dogs that have tested positive or negative. So uh, definitely if you'll check out, you can go to Dr. Ernie Ward and look at video and blogs or go to YouTube. Uh, but I've, I've got the full transcripts of those videos also online on my website. So hopefully that helped a little bit, but I think we gotta be transparent and be very, very clear that cats pose no risk of transmitting COVID-19 to humans at this time. All right, a follow-up based on what you've been saying. So, can the cats shed COVID to each other? And what about to canines? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, and yes, they can. That's why our recommendation of keeping them indoors because they could potentially get it. The study that, that we lean on the most, which was peer-reviewed and published, it came out of China, early days of this, this outbreak, and they took cats and they did give what we call a super inoculant. So they gave an excessive amount of SARS-CoV-2 to cats. And so what they did, and it was a really well-designed study in my opinion, so they took a super inoculant cat, okay, so a cat that they gave COVID-19 to, and they put next to it a control cat. And what they wanted to do, and these were, again, in isolated rooms, you know, with normal air, you know, so they didn't do anything to, like, keep it super sterile. They just said, okay, in a normal setting, if two cats were housed adjacent to each other, in this case, cages, could they transmit it? So the super inoculant control case, and they were able to. It wasn't 100% transmission, but it was north of 70%. Uh, and it probably would have been more had they had you know, higher, higher test uh, uh, samples of, of cats. Uh, this was not a great type of, of research, as you can imagine, uh, because they, these cats were euthanized. But having said that, they found that they were able to transmit it. It was very interesting. If you look at the studies about uh, not all the cats that were the control cats developed clinical signs, uh, but most did. So there is that possible to spread back and forth between cats. Uh, again, just getting back to normal hygiene. If somebody in your family contracts COVID-19, keep your cats and your dogs away from it. The question of can cats transmit it to dogs is a bit trickier. Uh, and the main criticism of the original China paper um, which is now being sort of uh, duplicated around the world to see if they get similar results, was the amount of initial viral load that they gave the cat. So that was not a natural transmission, right? So they gave them multitudes, exponentially more virus than they would have contracted, even from a person sick that right. was sick. And so the, the, the real question that most of us have is, if it's a naturally transmitted condition, do they shed enough to actually spread it to that cat in the control cage? And I, I think we could all say it's just a maybe, it's an unknown. But getting back to dogs, dogs, it's hard to infect them with SARS-CoV-2. I kind of hinted at these ACE2 receptors. Dogs just don't have the number of receptors that the SARS-CoV-2 virus and SARS virus attach to. And so when you look at species that have this specific receptor, you instantly, right at the top of the list, obviously under humans, is gonna be species like cats and ferrets, and dogs are much further down. And in fact, they looked at livestock, uh, and some of the livestock breeds 
had a fair number of ACE2 receptors, but again, just nothing similar to humans, which is why, again, you know, we go back to that old adage, viruses are species specific, but that's not exactly true because they're really more receptor specific. So I know that's a long, maybe too scientific or medically sounding, uh, but the reality is from a cat to a dog, that's, that's a real stretch. There's been no evidence of that whatsoever. There's been no studies to look at that directly. In fairness, I'll just be you know, honest with you on that. But based on natural viral loads of cats and what we know so far with SARS-CoV-2 and what we know from researching SARS since 2003, cats just don't seem to shed enough virus naturally to pose much of a threat to anybody. Okay. Anything, uh, anything. <laughs> so I'm gonna keep rolling with these questions. So the only issue would really be if COVID is on the fur, just like if the germs were on a surface. Yes, exactly. And that's really the biggest risk. If, if you go back and look at the very first video I made on this, probably the first of March, uh, it's the fomite, the mechanical vector we used to call it back in the day. And you're absolutely right. So somebody coughs or they have the virus on their hand or the cat rubs up against, how do they get it on their fur? That's the transmission. It's just like a door handle. Uh, and so having this is one of the reasons why you've heard people like me, uh, in particular in the media, telling people to wash their pets more frequently after they walk their dog in the park, for example, or any sort of publicly shared space, I think it's very important. If someone in your family contracts COVID-19, I think it's a good idea to wash your dogs and cats and ferrets more frequently in addition to keeping them separated. So great question. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ward. And we will say uh, goodbye to our wonderful guests and keep your eye on the schedule because Dr. Ward will be back as will others to talk about issues in shelter, rescue, and foster. So have a good day, everyone. And keep everybody safe. Bye. Give your pets a hug. Bye. <laughs>